Let's take a look at scenario one. You can download this and the other capture files from the GitHub link in the description below. So in this scenario, we're being told that there's a system on the network infested with malware. For some reason, the antivirus on the computer didn't detect it and the malware has managed to lock up the system. We don't have access to the hard drive, but we do have a full network packet capture of the incident. And we already know the IP of the infected host, this 12.183.1.55. This gives us a good starting point. Now for our goals. Since we have a full packet capture of the incident, we'll want to know where the system managed to contract the malware from. And if we can, we'll want to see if we can reassemble the network bytes to collect the malware file for further investigation. Then, we'll want to see what we can find out about the malware's activity on the system. Things like, what kind of calls to the internet does it make? And does it try to self-propagate like a worm? And are there any possible network traffic signatures that we can use to catch other systems potentially infected with the same piece of malware? Okay, we have our capture, we know what we're looking for, and we have our goals. One last thing. Before we move on, I want to give a little disclaimer. In this scenario, I will be showing you how to carve out a live virus file. I will be doing it on my Windows PC and will need to disable my antivirus to do so. Following my steps exactly should not cause any problems. But I recommend that you do not do this on Windows and use a different operating system with a virtual machine that you can reflash later. The virus is non-destructive and I'm not liable for any complications that might occur. So with that, let's get started. The first thing I like to do with any new Wireshark install is to add a few helpful columns. So let's go ahead and open our PCAP file. We can right click on one of the columns and select Column Preferences. From there, click on the plus sign to add two columns. The first we're going to call Stream ID and the second will be called Host. Set the fields to be tcp.stream and http.host. I like to put the stream ID column between protocol and length and the host column between length and info. So when we're done, it'll look like this. The other thing I like to do when starting a new investigation is to document what we know, our goals, and the results of each goal as we go through this. Since we're walking through this together, I won't write down the steps we've taken, but you'll want to write those down as well. Now that we have our Wireshark set up and our goals written down, we can start with our analysis. We begin with pattern matching. We already know the IP address of the system we're interested in, so let's create a display filter to show us only the traffic related to that device. We can type in ip.addr for IP address, equals equals, and then our victim's IP. Already, we see something that looks a little suspicious. Now, I want to point out something really important when investigating capture files. What may be true for one network may not be true for another. In this case, a .ru domain name might seem like something to worry about. But it's also possible that this is a company that does a lot of business with other Russian companies. Either way, we're going to want to check our suspicions. Right click and follow TCP stream. OK, there's a few things we want to take note of here. First, what's something strange that we notice about the web request? There's no user agent. Normally, when you use a web browser or even curl to make a web request, the browser includes its user agent in the web headers. So not seeing a user agent here can mean one of two things. Either the user manually downloaded this virus themselves using some sort of local utility, or there was already a piece of malware on the system that downloaded the rest of the virus. Next, what kind of file is it that's being downloaded? It's an exe, executable. Obvious, the name is pusk.exe, but another way we can tell what kind of file it is is by looking at the first few bytes of the file. This is known as the file signature. See, in Windows, you need to have the correct extension to open a file with the right application. .exe, .png, .doc. But with Linux, you don't need that. In fact, there's a Linux utility called file that will tell you what type of file something is. And it does that by looking at the file signatures. I'll show you where you can look up your own file signatures in a second. But first, let's write down what we have so far. The file was downloaded from this .ru domain with the name pusk.exe, and there was no user agent in the request. OK, so if we search Google for a file signature database, several pop up. Personally, I prefer garykessler.net, since it's updated regularly. From here, we can just do a Control-F search for MZ, 
which was the first two bytes of the file. And we can see here that MZ is a file signature for a number of Microsoft file types, including exe executables and DLL libraries. So now that we have the bytes of the file, how can we pull this out with Wireshark? Well, first, we want to change the traffic we're looking at to only include the communication coming from the server to the client. We can do that in the bottom left corner here. Then we'll want to show the raw bytes instead of their ASCII form. Finally, just save the file. Now, remember, this is a live virus, and since I'm using Windows, I don't want to save it as a .exe file. I'm also going to save this file twice, as dump1 and dump2. You don't have to do this, but you'll see why in a moment. We're not done yet. To get the original file, we need to strip off any and all protocol headers and footers. In this case, we only have the HTTP headers to deal with. Open the file in a hex editor. Now, the way HTTP headers work is that they let you know where the headers end and the data starts by this 0D0A, 0D0A. So just delete that and everything above it. When we're done, the file will start with MZ, the first few bytes of our file signature. See, this is why I saved the file twice. When I tried to reconstruct the original virus, my antivirus recognized it and put it in quarantine. So here, I'm going to go ahead and disable my antivirus and try it again. I'm only using Windows Defender, so all I need to do is open my security settings, virus and threat protection, then turn off real-time protection. This little video glitch is from it asking me for privilege permissions, so don't worry about that. Okay, with the antivirus now disabled, let's go ahead and try it again. And success. Immediately after carving out any file in this investigation, you'll want to get a hash of the file. It doesn't matter too much if it's MD5 or SHA-256, since the likelihood of a collision is pretty much zero. But you'll want to make sure that you get the hash value so that your process is repeatable and so that the carved out file and the original file can be matched together. For example, if you're following along and manage to get different hash values, that means that the file was carved out wrong and you should try it again. Don't worry, it happens from time to time, but this just illustrates why it's so important to collect the right hash values. Okay, now to send the file for analysis. If you're capable, you can analyze the file yourself, or we can do my preferred method and upload it to VirusTotal. I love VirusTotal. It's just a great website for malware research. Here we have the SHA-256 hash, the original name, pus.exe. Remember, we didn't give it that name. They already knew it and a list of details about the virus itself. There's also a list of antivirus vendors where they note which AV can and cannot detect the virus. Remember in our scenario where the antivirus wasn't able to detect it? It might be on this list with a green check mark, and maybe we should reevaluate our AV solution. Just a thought. Okay, so we were able to collect and analyze the malware file. Let's take a look at what kind of network traffic it generates. We can filter out the virus download by filtering out TCP Stream 5. And here we can see a lot of DNS traffic to what seems to be somewhat randomly generated domain names. If we scroll down a little, we can start to see quite a few SYN packets being sent before we reach our first SYN ACK. That usually means that they were all sent out in a short amount of time. If we kept scrolling down, we would start to see connections that were being established and then closed immediately. If you're new to malware traffic, this is pretty standard form for botnet persistence. The virus comes with a preloaded list of domains, or with a built-in way to generate domain names. It then tries to reach out to each of the domain names in the list to see what's available and online. That way, if some of the domains in the list are blocked or shut down, it still has a way to call home. Let's look at one of the packets to see what TCP port it's trying to communicate on. Okay, port 80 so most likely web traffic. Now, if we wanted to see which of these domains it connected to and stayed connected to, it's very likely that it would be using HTTP web traffic. So let's check the host headers. Add and and http.host to our filter, and we can see that most of the communication happens with this whammo jaffdesi.com domain. Let's follow one of the streams and see what kind of traffic we have. Yep, this looks like a normal web page. 
might have redirected the user to their site to buy a fake antivirus. It says here, Windows 7 Total Security. Let's make a note of what we found. We saw that we now have a list of domain names that we could add to our blacklist. We also noticed a spike of DNS traffic, followed by a spike in port 80 traffic. Okay, we're almost done. The last thing we want to know is if the virus tries to self-propagate over the network, like a worm. So what do we look for? Well, if the virus tries to reach out to other devices on the network, it might try to follow RFC 1918 and look for private IP addresses. There's also a chance that it takes the IP address of the infected machine and tries to reach out to other devices on that network as well. If you're not familiar, RFC 1918 is the standard for private IP addressing. This is where we get the 10.0 networks, the 192.168, and the 172.16 networks. These are all well-known addresses, and they're sometimes reached out to by computer worms. We're also going to want to check the 12 networks with a slash 8 subnet, because it's at least a class A address. So we're going to build one large filter, and you're going to want to be careful doing this, since the larger the filter, the trickier it can be. We want to include the source IP address of 12.183.1.55 and the list of the following addresses. 192.168.0.0 slash 16, 172.16.0.0 slash 12, 10.0.0.0 slash 8, and 12.000 slash 8. Again, since 12 dot is a class A address. We're going to use these double pipes instead of the double ands, since we only need one of these to show up in our filter. And we want to make sure that we wrap it with the parentheses for the proper Boolean logic with the and earlier. OK, let's throw this into Wireshark. Hmm, you might see these ICMP destination unreachable messages. This is actually a bug in the Wireshark filters where it thinks that the ICMP messages are sourced and destined for the same address. These are quick to look through, and we can easily sort them out by just adding no ICMP to the end of our filter. At this point, it doesn't look like there are any attempts for the virus to try and connect to other internal systems. So let's write this down, and that's it. Awesome. So now we're done. Let's hop back to the slides and review what we found. OK, let's revisit what we found. Where did the user contract the malware from? Well, the user made a direct call to the executable. Therefore, the user either deliberately downloaded the malware, or there was a piece of malware sleeping on the system. How about the malware file? Well, we were able to get that carved out. We had the MD5 and the SHA-256 hashes of these files. We were able to analyze them through virus total. So here are some results uh, taking screenshots of the virus total output. So here we have a list of antivirus that was able to detect the virus, and here's a list of those that weren't. So what kind of calls did it make? Well, we saw a large number of DNS queries to a number of what seemed like randomly generated domain names, and we also saw a lot of HTTP communication for websites located on a few of these domains. Did it try to self-propagate? No, we didn't find any evidence that it tried to reach out to any other internal network addresses. And as far as traffic signatures, we saw a high volume of DNS queries within a short amount of time. So that's definitely something to look at. Well, that's it for now. In the next video, we're going to take a look at our second scenario.